So uh, Rick, we're listed hazardous waste guidance. Uh, we're not talking about this type of listing, um, but it is definitive LeBron James is in fact a better basketball player than Kobe Bryant. Money doesn't lie. All right, so in a lot of respects, uh, listed waste is a lot easier than characteristic waste. There's a definition. You look at the listing, does it meet the definition? Yes. Okay, you have a listed waste. Um, EPA uses the four listing categories, F, K, P, and U. Can you hear me in the back? Okay. Uh, F are non-industry sp specific process wastes. K are indus industry specific. Uh, P and U discarded or intended to be discarded unused CCPs. And we'll get into all these in detail. I'm going to be going quickly through slides, but then we'll be taking pauses and going through examples. So I'd suggest uh, holding off on questions until that time. We'll slow, that, slow down a bit. Uh, so again, listing determination, it has to do with the source of the material, not just the material itself, but the source. So that's very important. Uh, hydrous waste ended up being listed because it met characteristic criteria. And you'll see these uh, in the slides, and this is what they mean. And that was why they are listed uh, on the listing, because they met those criteria. The E, you will we'll rarely see. It's a baghouse antimony containing waste that we won't even touch today. So uh, F listing, uh, just by a show of hands in the room, how many people regulate F listed waste or how many people generate? Put them up high, don't be shy. All right, yeah, so this is a non-specific uh, source. So of course it's gonna be uh, generated more widely than um, perhaps an industry specific source. Uh, you have your spent solvents, one through, uh, uh, F1 through five, electroplating uh, and other metal finishing waste, six through 19 and then these five. We're not going to be touching on these five today. If you do regulate those or if you generate them, I suggest uh, finding someone else who does and ask them questions. The, other, the first two are seen in most Koopas during inspections. So it's important for solvent use, it has to be spent. And we'll get into the definition of spent on the next slide. But um, it has to be used for its intended purpose and uh, somehow um, used for its solvent and then becomes dirty or whatever and becomes spent. Uh, there are ingredients and formulations of other products that might contain solvents, so, such as paint. A paint might, have, uh, it might be solvent bearing. Well, that paint, when used, would not meet the F listing criteria because it wasn't used for s the solvent purposes. It was used for paint. So it's just an important designation. So it has to be used as a solvent, it must be spent, and it must meet a specific before use concentration, which the next five slides will get into great detail, those uh, concentrations. And there's a definition of spent material. If you're not acquainted with uh, 66260.10, you should be by now if you're in this class. I hope you are. So F1 through five, for mixtures of one, two, four, and five, greater than or equal to 10% by volume, and that's uh, before use volumes. So it's not on the back end, it's on the, the front end. All appropriate listings apply to that spent solvent. This is a bad example, but here it is anyways. 25% uh, carbon tetrachloride, F1, and you have 75% water, you have 25% total listing, listed waste, and your end waste, it would carry the spent solvent listing for F1. F1 are spent non I'm sorry, spent halogenated solvents used in degreasing, tetrachloroethylene, trichloroethylene, methylene chloride, among others, containing before use a total of the 10% or more by volume, including F2, 4, and 5. And it also includes the still bottoms from the recovery of those spent solvents. You have a Ricker Online document here. You'll see some references in green in uh, my slides. Those are to this particular uh, reference on this slide. And so for F1, there's a large scale degreasing operation application uh, by that Ricker Online document, EPA guidance, says this F code should be used for large scale degreasing operations. It's a bit confusing because when you go to the F2, you see, oh, tetrachloroethylene, methylene chloride, trichloroethylene, those were on the F1 as well. 
and the designation is, or the distinction is, it's for large scale for F1. F2 is more of an application for your dry cleaners, your auto body repair shops, your parts washer. So when you go to those facilities, they should be using the F2 listing. F3 is the, a bit of the outlier among the F1 through 5s, and it's spent non-halogenated solvents, uh, xylene, acetone, um, methyl, isobutyl ketone are among them. And it's all spent solvent mixture blends before use only the above spent solvents and all spent solvent mixture blends containing before use one or more of the above non halogenated solvents and a total of 10% or more by volume of one or more one, two, four, five. I'm taking the time to read that almost verbatim because it's a bit confusing. We'll get into some examples in a bit. F4, cresols, chrysolic acid, nitrobenzene, again, 10% or more by volume, F2, 1, and 5 included. F5 also, uh, spent non halogen solvent, toluene, carbon disulfide, you have your isobutanol, again, 10% or more by, by volume, including your F1, 2, and 4. So, some examples, and I'm going to ask for your participation. You have 5% uh, F1, 3% F4, 2% F5 for a total of 10. We were doing math early in the morning. That's good. And so what listing would this waste have? Shout it out. If you're sure of your answer, shout it out. I'm not hearing anything. Louder. One. Okay. Anything else? Four. Anything else? Be confident. Five, one, four, and five. Total 10%, so all of them apply. 10% is the total, all of them apply. Another example, 30%, 1% of an F5 and an F2. Oh, there's only 1% of an F2, we don't have to worry about that. No, total is above 10%, all of them apply. Which brings us to F3, the outlier. It's this only F3 constituent that's pure technical grade. Pure is just that, it's a pure product. Technical grade is another animal, and we'll address it on the next slide. But it's also one or more F3 constituent and 10% or more of the other F-listed uh, prior solvents to use. So uh, via the solvent mixture rule, which I'll reference in a couple slides from a Rick Rowe Online document, there is no de minimis amount for the F3 listing which means you can have 1% F3 and it meets the listing criteria in certain instances if it's only an F3, which is a, a lot different than the other F listings. This technical grade reference, it refers to anything that's marketed for use, anything that you can uh, buy, you can purchase, you can look up uh, via your manufacturer, your supplier, okay, I can, I can get it in that uh, percentage. There is no regulatory definition that comes from this guidance from EPA. Uh, so if you're an uh, industrial painter and you have 99.5% xylene and it's, you're trying to get rid of it, well, does it meet the listing? I, I'm not sure. The answer is, well, can you purchase it in that amount? If the answer is yes, it meets the listing criteria. If the answer is no, then it likely doesn't meet the, the listing criteria, but it's likely a characteristic waste at 99%. <laughs> so, some examples. 99.9% .9 xylene, which is a technical grade in this example, in F3, plus 0.1% water. Yes, that's an obvious one. That meets the listing. How about this? 15% tetrachloroethylene, 1% ethyl benzene in F3, 84% water. Please be loud with your answer. What listing, what listing would carry? this waste. One and three. One and three. Yes. Nine percent tetrachloroethylene, one percent ethylbenzene. What listing criteria would apply? Any other answers? It's not listed. It's not listing, it doesn't meet the criteria because F1, 2, 4, 5 
all total is less than 10 percent. And 1 percent ethyl benzene, you said, well, Nick, you said there's no diminished amount of an F3. Only if it o only has F3. If the only F3, so if you take away the 9 percent tetrachloroethylene and the F3 meets the other listing criteria, then it would have the F3 listing. But it may, this might be a characteristic waste, and that's something that you would ask your facility. So 1 percent ethyl benzene? Yes, uh, not so fast. Depends. Is that the technical grade? So is it the technical grade? Can you buy it in that amount? And that's the solvent mixture rule, uh, Rick Online reference on the bottom there. So any questions on F listed waste before, uh, I'm sorry, F1 through 5 listing? Okay. So electroplating operations, those include your, your common uh, and precious metal electroplating, your anodizing, chemical etching, milling, um, and then cleaning and stripping with these waste codes that apply. The F6 waste code is wastewater sludge, wastewater treatment sludge from those electroplating operations with obviously these exceptions. What's Title 22 without exceptions? And this is the definition of sludge, but basically it says anything coming out of a generator's wastewater treatment system is sludge. Therefore, it would have the F6 listing uh, if it met the, if it was from electroplating operations. Uh, some waste generated from metal heat treating operations, a little bit different using heat instead of electricity, are F10, 11, and 12. What's important to note it, for these is that they will only have that, uh, meet that listing if they are arsenic containing. Anyone dealing with uh, these types of waste streams? By show of hands? I only see one hand up. Sorry, you know, no other, no help in the room. Uh, and then this F19, uh, wastewater treatment sludge from uh, chromating, phosphating, metacoloring, um, just another F listing. Which brings us to K listed, uh, listing. These are specific industry sources. So you look at the definition, and it's not that, uh, oh, I, you know, it, my waste is similar to the K waste on the K waste on the back end. It's that, oh, I, this is the industry that I belong in. And it's one of these industries. Does anyone regulate these industries? Or does anyone, uh, is anyone from one of these industries? By a show of hands, raise them high, please. Look around the room, those are your resources. That's all we're covering on K-listing, moving on. PNU listing uh, pertain to unused CCPs. Leon touched on this a little bit. Um, P-listed, they're on the P-list because they're really bad. A little bit amount will cause immediate danger to, your, to health. Uh, you listed items are not as bad. They're carcinogenic, teratogenic, so they'll kill you, but they'll kill you really slowly. But that's why they are on a special list of their own. So commercial chemical products, it's a chemical substance which is manufactured or formulated for commercial uh, or manufacturing use, and it also has one sole active ingredient. Those are the takeaways from that slide. So one sole active ingredient, and it's, it's manufactured for a certain use. The distinction for, uh, for this is that a chemical that's unused can be considered an off-specification CCP. And that's an, it's a CCP if it's contaminated without being used for its intended purpose. So if you're storing a CCP and there's some rainwater intrusion, there's some damage, there's some rust from the container. Um, small bits of contamination that weren't being, it wasn't being used for its intended purpose, but it just became contaminated via storage or other means, that would meet this off-specification uh, criteria. A chemical that's used is used for its intended purpose and is therefore spent. A pure u listed waste that is spent would not it's not pure U listing just by the definition. So a pure U listed chemical wouldn't meet the pure U uh, listing definition if it was spent. 
We have technical grade rearing its, uh, its head again. That refers again to all commercial chemicals that are uh, at a marketed grade that you can purchase. And that is the sole active ingredient. It means one uh, ingredient only. So PNU listing is applied to unused. We covered that off spec CCPs and example and some more examples are shelf life exceeded so something expired beyond the manufacturer's recommendation QAQC potential perhaps they said no this doesn't meet our criteria oh what do we do with it uh, and uh, spill residues as well and s from soil contamination debris those are covered in the listing so it's not just the chemical that may have been contaminated but it's also anything else that it may have touched or contaminated in addition to its container or inner li liner, which is um, a regulatory hassle for facilities and regulators. And, but it's regulated because of its residue that's within the container. So uh, let's see, more of the same. I'm gonna just go and skip that, uh, that slide. It's in there for reference though. So examples, fluorine. P56, uh, that's an active ingredient mixed with chlorine. It's not a chlorine, which isn't a PRU uh, listed, but it's also an active ingredient. Would this carry the P listing? I see three shaking heads, four, that's good, good. It's catching on. So yeah, not a PRU, why? Two active ingredients. Keypone. U142 at 3% concentration, which is the active ingredient plus some functionally inert ingredients. Would it carry the U listing? Yes, we are all awake and doing good. All right. So, mixture rule. Uh, Leon touched a little bit on this uh, in his slides too. For listed hazardous waste, if it's mixed with another waste, the resulting mixture is a listed hazardous waste except for, again, we have exceptions, except for those uh, 29 ICR only, that's ignitable, corrosive, or reactive only, um, if, they don't, uh, if they're not hazardous at the point of generation, if they don't exhibit the characteristic for which they're listed. So notice, that basically means anything that has the toxicity characteristics for the basis of its listing, via the mixture rule, anything it touches, it's hazardous waste, you're stuck, and there is no de minimis amount. Uh, based off of that RICRA online document. So just a little bit, it gets you in. There are uh, some exemptions and exclusions, and uh, Leon touched on upon those sections earlier. So these uh, 29 ICR only, uh, F3 is that, that common solvent that was the, the outlier of the F1 through 5s that's uh, on that list, and here's that list. F3 is on the top, but if you notice, going down this list, I don't know if you can see this in the back, but um, the website's in the presentation and you can go to the list. There's no T's, there's no T's in that whole uh, column. It's only ignitable, corrosive, or reactive. So we ask, okay, well, what about the rinse aid? Hey, I, I can rinse a container and then I'm good, right? The container then won't, wouldn't meet the, the listing criteria anymore. Well, that's true. The container might not list, meet the listing criteria. But what's, what about the rinse aid? The rinse aid via the mixture rule is a regulated P-listed waste. So if you have a P-listed chemical, you're stuck with a hazardous waste no matter what. Um, unless you petition the EPA for a delisting, which is always a fun process. Um, and we'll, we'll mention a little bit more about this a little bit. Let's we'll say, what about an unknown? I, I bought a property. I bought a property or, um, well, yeah, you bought a property and there's some contamination on the back 40 or there's a tank that I don't know what's in it. And the question is, well, you test it and, oh, it, it's, it's uh, this F1 solvent. So let's list it as F1. Not so fast. Your sample test alone isn't enough. You need to know the source. Because the, all of the listing criteria is industry, why it was listed to begin with, it's that process waste. So a generator, via, via this, um, let's see, the Ricker Online documents here, the generator has to make a good faith effort saying, look, I determined if the material was a listed waste or I couldn't. 
So if I did make that determination, I couldn't find out the information, then you don't have to call it a listed waste. But again, it might meet a characteristic. And as a regulator, I'd have to be very comfortable with my facility to see their good faith effort. I mean, there's lots of documentation. So if you're a facility or a regulated body, I just make sure that you're doing your due diligence fully or in work with your regulator. So what about acutely hazardous waste? There's a special section in there that says, oh, one kilogram or 2.2 pounds of an acutely hazardous waste, bam, you're a large quantity generator. And if you generate that amount in a given month. Well, LQG, as most of us know, the much more restrictive uh, or uh, regulation, set of regulations that apply to them. It's like, oh my goodness, I have these you know, empty containers that are popping me into LQG status, oh no. This being one of them, osmium tetroxide, and that's a clue right there. Skull and crossbones, never, never a friendly symbol. Extremely toxic. So this RICAR online document, EPA uh, wrote a letter basically saying that the weight of the container does not uh, apply. It's the weight of the residue. And the question is, on our inspections, I don't know how many of the inspectors in Riverside County you're going through the inspections, and okay, looking at the waste manifests. Oh, uh, five pounds, 55 pounds, 200 pounds. Oh, ding, 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 you're at two, two pounds of, of this uh, acutely hazardous waste. And it's always important to note that most transporters weigh the total container, the total thing. So it's up to the generator to sh tell you, hey, it should just be the residue in there. But this is a, a very good and clear document that spells that out, that it should only be the residue. And residue, in most cases, isn't gonna weigh that much, so they're in all likelihood gonna fall out of the LQG listing, or uh, LQG designation. Which brings us to hazardous waste pharmaceuticals. Uh, last year, in this presentation, I mentioned that uh, P-listed hazardous waste pharmaceuticals, which are all uh, listed here, would were on the proposed universal waste rule for EPA. That is no longer the case. The U EPA um, was petitioned enough by environmental groups that they felt the universal waste wasn't a stringent enough standard for these this waste stream. So right now, I don't know the status of um, the rules being written, but they are planned to be written this uh, this year. I imagine the, uh, the other speaker knows much more about that. But the, the take home is, is if you have pharmacies, hospitals uh, with pharmacies in your uh, jurisdictions, they have P-listed waste. S excuse me, specifically the warfarin. It's very hard to get away from that one. Chemo drugs at hospitals. Um, there's a whole lot of other chemo drugs that, that document that's being discussed in the other session that they suggest should be regulated. So we might see a revised listing uh, from that document. Who knows, time will tell. But right now, the, as it is, P-listed hazardous waste containers and the actual pills, drops, pills, spills, those are, those are something that you should be seeing at pharmacies and hospitals. However, having said that, some light at the end of the tunnel, Rick Online excludes fentramine salts. Uh, this one excludes epinephrine salts. This one excludes nitroglycerin. So we knocked off three from the previous slide. There are several um, letters that do include nicotine, however. So nicotine is included. And warfarin, there has been uh, references to it, but no, nothing directly uh, stating it. But it's, it's pretty much in. So warfarin and nicotine at your basic pharmacies will be very common. Uh, the other ones probably at hospitals because those are used in a clinical setting. Any questions on those? All right. You guys are listening fast. Well done. All right, so just some uh, scenarios here. Commercial uh, product being disposed contains uh, the, the P listing and the U listing, both of which are active ingredients. And oh, both, okay, ding, 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 red flag, we know. No, those listings do not apply because uh, they have more than one active ingredient. 
A QAQC solution consists of aldrin and dialdrin dissolved in methanol solvent. It's going to be disposed. What waste code should be applied to that excess solution? Well, it's neither P4 or P37 because there's two active ingredients. But you say, oh, there's a solvent. And I remember he talked about solvents. So uh, it could be that, uh, that, that F3 listing. But then remember, it has to be used for its intended purpose. It has to be spent, in other words, the solvent criteria. And this isn't spent. It's just used in the ingredients of the product. It's one of those inert carrier materials. So it would not meet the listing. However, however it would likely be characteristically hazardous. There's always the characteristic to deal with. So you have your paint stripper. It uh, contains methylene chloride, toluene, and other inert materials. In the unused paint stripper, is it a, uh, a listed CCP when disposed? And it depends. It depends entirely on what's active, which ingredients are active when removing the, the paint. If it, on the label it says only one, then that would be the, the P listing that you would follow, or the U listing. If only, uh, if two of them, then it would obviously fall out of the listing. And uh, you all still have the characteristic. And if it was a spent material, so if it was actually a used stripper, then you have the F2 or F5 to fall back on. So these are some resources. Um, Leon went through multiple resources uh, for his presentation. These are uh, very good as well. Uh, documents, but guidance documents uh, for California on these two, um, and then EPA guidance here. McCoy's Rick Run Unraveled, very useful tool. They have a booth uh, in the very back corner. I would highly recommend their training. It's, um, it's really good. Um, additional for characteristic uh, regulations, you can go to the, the link that's uh, embedded in the PowerPoint there. And for listed waste, EPA has a, a pretty good um, guidance there. Yeah, that middle thing looks pretty good right about now, doesn't it? Yeah. That's, that, that was last night, though. So uh, please take a, a five close, uh, very quick five-minute break. Uh, feel free to go to another session where you're going to miss a little bit of it. We're just.